pub landlord Mick Hughes is ferociously attacked in the living quarters above his bar. He's battered and beaten over the head and left bleeding to die. After hundreds of hours of investigation, the police are baffled. They just don't have enough evidence to make an arrest. Uh, there was a feeling of, of a marathon about that inquiry. Local psychic Angela McGee visits the scene of the crime. I could see a vision of Mick's body lying under the window, and she could see his injuries. Her spirit allies show her the terrible truth. I got this awful shudder through me. And I realized then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Can Angela's supernatural visions help bring the brutal killer to justice? Sunday, April 27, 2003. Police race towards the quiet village of Pelsall near Birmingham, towards the Royal Oak Pub. Staff arriving for work have found the body of the landlord, Mick Hughes, brutally bludgeoned to death. Detective Inspector Ian Bamber and Detective Constable Mike Crump have the job of catching the killer. Mick's body was found in his private bedroom area that was on the first floor of the pub. He had sustained uh, serious head injuries consistent with him being struck uh, with an object. The attack had been ferocious, uh, sustained uh, and really malicious. Um, if offenders had meant to incapacitate him, uh, to render him unconscious or knock him out, he could have easily done that with one or two blows, but no, they hit him again and again and again. The bedroom upstairs where Mick slept was ransacked. All the early indications suggested uh, was that it had been a burglary that had gone drastically wrong. Michael Hughes was a family man, just two months away from his 60th birthday. His daughter Sharon is devastated by the news. You see it on TV, but until you've actually lived it, you can't describe how it destroys you as a person and as a family. You really can't. They asked me and my sister if we could go down to the morgue and identify my dad's body. It was the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. <laughs> Sharon and her family are desperate for justice. But despite weeks of intensive forensic investigation and hundreds of interviews with local people, the police cannot find any conclusive evidence. A neighboring publican decides to call in psychic medium Angela McGee. I had a phone call from a friend um, and she asked me to go down uh, to help with the local murder. Um, and my reaction was, what if they don't believe, you know? Um, I'm not gonna go down there and look stupid. I said, I'll wait till I get a message through spirit. I'll wait till the right moment. Within days, that moment comes. Well, I had a message from my own father in spirit. It was him that actually told me to go. He said, what about this murder? What about this murder? And then I knew I had to go. I believe that uh, mediumship, you are an instrument of the spirit world. It's not voluntary. You just do what you have to do. Angela drives to the Royal Oak pub. She's never been here before and knows nothing about the murder. But that is about to change. I sat there in meditation for a little while, said my prayers and put my hands up and said, Dear God, what have I got to tell these people? With that, I had a vision. I saw three men climbing up a black fire escape staircase over the roof over the railings and in through the French windows. And I thought to myself, that is where they've got in this building. Emboldened by her vision, Angela decides to go in. She is greeted by Beryl Chapman, former partner of Mick Hughes, who is looking after the Royal Oak. Beryl shows Angela to the living quarters of the pub. She stands in the hall. Then suddenly she is shown a second vision. 
And I could see bodies struggling, as if there was a real push-pull-you type thing going on. And there was blood. It was just a flash, literally a flash of vision. Angela goes to the bedroom where Mick met his grisly fate. As she moves into the room, Spirit sends her another terrifying glimpse of the past. Again, another flash of vision. You could see a vision of Mick's body lying under the window. But you could see his injuries in his head and down the one side. Now Angela sees something wonderful. And all of a sudden, I saw Mick in my mind's eye. The spirit of the dead publican appears standing before her. And he was making a point of a thick gold chain bracelet which was holding up. Mick tells Angela that his killer also stole his bracelet. Mick said that he knew that person, he had drunk with that person, he had fished with that person, he knew that person very, very well. I felt totally aghast. I just thought, take a deep breath here, I can't believe what I've just heard. It's an astonishing revelation. But before Angela can react, she has another vision. Three men running away. It's almost as if they've rushed past me, and if I could feel their panic. But one of them had something the size of a shoebox with him. That's all I saw. Angela has never experienced such an incredible barrage of visions, but as she leaves the pub, she has the most terrifying insight of all. As I walked through the pub, I glanced at the bar, and there behind the bar was a young man pulling pints. I got this awful shudder through me, complete coldness. I just felt that there was complete emptiness there, as if he'd got no soul. And I realised then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Not waiting to see his face, Angela runs from the pub. If she's correct, the killer is still right under the noses of the police. Landlord Mick Hughes has been brutally murdered above his pub, the Royal Oak, by person or persons unknown. Psychic Angela McGee has visited the scene of the crime. Her spirit allies sent her an astonishing series of visions containing clues about the murder. I saw the vision of three men going up to the Black's Forest escape staircase. I then saw Mick's body. I saw Mick himself. I saw three men leaving with something the size of a shoebox. I glanced at the bar and I realised then that I was actually looking at the culprit. Despite months of painstaking investigation, the police still don't have enough solid evidence to make an arrest. And when, when there was a feeling of, of a marathon about, about that inquiry. Uh, there was a, a, a great deal of information coming in that was, that was being looked at, um, but uh, little that was, that was helping us to get to, to the bottom of what had actually happened. The police are running out of options when fate leads them to Angela. In the course of uh, my inquiries, I met a woman who had met Angela McGee at one of her psychic uh, meetings. And uh, this woman uh, stated that Angela had uh, discussed the, the murder with her. We decided that whilst um, the evidential opportunities might be limited, it would really be uh, foolhardy and a bit ignorant not to at least um, go and speak to Angela. Mike Crump and a colleague go to Angela's house to interview her. She invited us in. She made us a, a, a cup of tea, uh, and we spoke to, to Angela about, uh, about what she knew. Angela tells the police about her vision on the fire escape and of the body in the bedroom. She had no way of knowing these things, but her account matches closely what police found in forensic examination. I was um, startled and sceptical, um, equally curious and intrigued. Now she really begins to surprise the police. She claimed that uh, the three men had been involved in the murder and that one of those men uh, had known uh, Michael Hughes. It sounds incredible, but Angela's information fits with a number of theories the police are working on. To put numbers on offenders uh, raised some eyebrows, but from 
analysing the scene and trying to generate some hypotheses around what had happened, I think we were all fairly comfortable that it was more than one. She'd had a vision of them running away, one of them uh, carrying a shoebox-shaped object. The police know what Angela does not, that a safe the size of a shoebox was taken from the pub. We clearly knew that the safe had been ripped from its housing, so to hear Angela describe a boxed-shaped object being carried by, by a man was uh, fascinating. Angela's visions confirm facts the police already know or things they suspect. Her account fitted in on a number of features with the hypotheses that we were running on. The difficulty for us was trying to match any evidential facts that we knew about with Angela's vision. At the time of speaking to Angela, uh, I was a little cynical and sceptical about the information she was providing, but in the fullness of time, it was quite surprising how accurate uh, some of the information she provided turned out to be. Angela has given the police fresh clues, but for now, they don't know what to make of them. The lead officer tries to reassure Mick's grieving family. He'd come out and he'd explain there is things happening and we are working, but obviously we can't tell you everything in case it leaks out or in case it's wrong information we're receiving. He said, but trust me, we will sort this out and we will come one day with the answers for you. For the police, the pressure is on. Then Angela McGee has another startling revelation. I woke up the one morning, as I do sometimes, with messages. What I kept getting in my mind was a dolphin, block switch, dolphin, block switch. Angela phones a friend to tell her about the message. I was telling her about, I'm sure this is to do with the murder. I was getting the dolphin, block switch, dolphin, block switch. And she said, there's a dolphin pub. I wanted to uh, relay that information to Mike Crump, so I gave him a call. Operation Greenside, DC Crump speaking, how can I help you? And I told him about the dolphin and, and block switch and that something would happen in three days. All of a sudden, I get a name. Yeah, OK, let's move, just get a, a pad and I'll just write it down. I felt it was more like a nickname of either Daz or Gaz. And I felt that was also associated with murder. Angela's information is relayed to the incident room, but for now, it's useless. Then, the police make a key discovery. They find the missing safe in a canal. This is the canal at Slacky Lane, uh, from where we recovered the safe that was from the Royal Oak pub. It was a breakthrough. Uh, it is important that uh, we recover uh, physical evidence, uh, such as the safe. Suddenly, Angela's message about the dolphin becomes clear and the Dolphin Public House is uh, situated just at the top of the road, um, about 150 yards away from the spot where I'm standing now. There is no earthly way that Angela could have known this. At the time that Angela uh, spoke to us about the Dolphin Public House, there was no obvious connection between that pub uh, and our investigation. It hadn't featured at all. At the very least, it was uh, interesting. Police are left wondering about Angela's message of the nickname. The, the difficulty for us, uh, uh, where, where do you put Angela? What do you do with what Angela can tell you? And, and the problem is that you can't use it, can you? You can't ask Angela to step into a Crown Court witness box and on oath say, I'm a medium and I know what happened. It's completely inadmissible. To convict, they still need more concrete evidence. Then, exactly six months after the murder, the Royal Oak pub is burgled again. This time, police get the lead they've been waiting for. Bizarrely, um, on the exact six-month anniversary of Mick's death at the pub, the pub was broken into again in very chillingly similar circumstances. This time, eyewitnesses recognise the thief. Part-time bartender Gavin Chapman, son of Beryl Chapman, Mick Hughes' partner at the Royal Oak. Gavin Chapman uh, had a severe uh, drug problem. Uh, we believed he, he was uh, addicted to, uh, to heroin and possibly crack cocaine. Michael Hughes uh, was always quite suspicious that, that Gavin was taking money from him in various forms in order to fund his, his drug addiction. 
The police had always suspected Gavin Chapman might be involved in the murder, but he has an alibi with two other men, Stephen Lockley and Lee Worgan. We had evidence that, that cast doubt on their movements uh, in terms of the accounts that they had given. Um, but as far as, uh, as convicting them for a murder was concerned, we had very little. Now the police take a gamble. They bring all three men in for questioning. One by one, the men are interrogated and their stories scrutinized. In the initial stages, they, they, they stuck by their, their witness statements. I think they thought that if they maintained their original pack of lies, that um, they would walk. I'm, I'm sure that they were, they were that blasé and confident that they thought that they could, they could just bluff it out. Relatively quickly into the, uh, the interview process, one of them changed the story. And they began to um, point the finger at each other. The men confess to burgling the Royal Oak on the night of the murder. They accuse each other of being the killer. Police decide to charge them all with murder as a joint enterprise. It's a bold strategy. There was a concern that was at the back of my mind that uh, around that joint enterprise argument, the jury wouldn't be able to clearly identify in their own minds who it was that struck the fatal blows. Uh, we felt that we had a very good and a very strong case, uh, but uh, you are in the, in the hands of the, the jury. Y you're hopeful, uh, but you've always just, you know, you're crossing two fingers and hoping for the best. The trial is set for October 2004 in Birmingham, with three men charged, at least one of whom knew Mick and worked behind the bar. Everything that Angela told the police seems to be coming true. Gavin Chapman, Lee Worgan, and Stephen Lockley are set to be tried for McHugh's murder. Waiting for the result, Angela goes on with her normal work as a medium. It was a few months um, later, uh, after I had my, my visit to the, to the Royal Oak, that I had a phone call. Carol Hall has lost her mother and wants a medium to contact her in spirit. I had, had no previous knowledge of Angela before this, before this phone number was handed to me. In fact, she was one of about four numbers that were handed to me. And the reason I picked Angela was because she was the, the one more local, because I didn't know if, they had a, if there was a radius to how far they'd travel. And like, the address was pretty local, so I thought um, I'd go for Angela. Angela visits Carol one evening at her home. Angela sat. Uh, in the bedroom and I sat on the chair, more or less opposite to her. The spirit of a mother came through, and I felt that a mother's energy was all around the bedroom where we were. And I told Carol that her mother was with her son in spirit. We got to talking about it, and then they just said, which was the devastating bit, it was Michael. And that was when I just went to pieces, um, and I was that was my brother. And she said, your mum's telling me she called him Michael, everybody else called him Mick, which was spot on. And all of a sudden, I had a flash of the Royal Oak and a flash of Mick in my mind. And I said, it's Mick from the Royal Oak murder. The look on Angela's face, it couldn't be captured on tape when she suddenly realised who she was talking about. She said, he keeps telling me, I've been there, I've been there. And he says, can I say, can I ask, is it the pub in Pelsall? And I says, yeah. It's an amazing revelation. Angela didn't know it, but Carol Hall is Mick Hughes' sister. Mick's spirit has sought her out again. I could hear Mick say that he would see justice and he would see justice three times. All I heard was justice, justice, justice. And then I says to Carol, I can see, I can see the family with their hands up in the air in triumph. And he also said something about Stafford and time, which I had to relay, which didn't make sense to me at the time. With the trial hanging in the balance, Angela's message gives comfort to Carol. With my brother coming through, by an Angela and saying that justice will be done. She was so right with Mum, I wanted this to be so right as well. But until the jury gives their verdict, the family can only hope that Angela's telling the truth. 
Just days before the trial is due to start in Birmingham, part of Mick's message becomes clear. Another case has overrun. The trial is moved to Stafford Crown Court. The court case, up until the Friday prior to the Monday's died for the court case, was going to be Birmingham. Then it was going to be Wolverhampton. And on the Monday, we had to go to Stafford, which was uncanny, very uncanny, because we weren't aware of that. Nobody was. For police and the family, it's a tense time. You've always got that element of doubt in the back of your mind and you're worried about how the jury will perceive the evidence that you, that you feel is very strong and how your witnesses will come across as well. The trial runs for three long weeks. I was struck by how appallingly badly uh, the three male defendants uh, conducted themselves throughout the whole trial. Uh, they sat at the back of the court uh, and grinned, chuckled to each other, uh, made smug comments about some of the witnesses that appeared uh, in the witness box. And when they, were, when they were ultimately asked to give evidence, they made the worst job of it I've ever seen in my life. They were absolutely appalling. Um, they were flippant, clearly telling lies. Chapman was asked whether he wanted to take the, the oath, and his very first words to the jury were, whatever. Um, he, he, he did himself no favours. To hear people read it out as to the horrific injuries and how they occurred and how many times they hit my dad, um, that was really hard. And at one stage, my mum and my two brothers had to leave because they couldn't cope. Because to everybody else, it's a story. To us, it was our dad. Uh, Finally, the moment of truth arrives. When the jury went out, uh, the, the courtroom is uh, charged with emotion. It's all right, you're just sitting there thinking, please, God, let them say guilty. The three men are found guilty. As Angela predicted, justice has been done three times. Each of the three men were convicted of uh, the murder uh, of, of Michael Hughes. Uh, they were also uh, convicted of, uh, of burglary and attempting to pervert the, the course of justice in terms of having a lie to us in, in the form of their witness statements. It was just unreal. It was, it was a dream come true. <sighs> As the family leave court, a photographer is waiting. He said, well, for the picture, you're going to have to punch the air and smile. In a flash, Angela's last vision becomes reality. But when I saw them, their hands go up, and I thought, yeah, that's completed the picture now. Angela's messages to the police and the family seem to have proved uncannily accurate. On speaking to Angela initially, I, I was quite cynical and, and sceptical about the nature of the information she provided. But in the fullness of time, aspects of it uh, turned out to be uh, quite accurate. Uh, whilst it was always of, of limited uh, value to us as, as, as police officers, uh, this was uh, nevertheless uh, surprising. Stepping outside the police officer function and thinking about, about um, myself as a person and, and, and Carol and Sharon spending some time with Angela, if I found myself in the same circumstances and I saw the olive branch of hope, would I reach out for it? Yeah, I probably would. It's been an incredible experience for Angela. I feel I've done my job's worth. I know that I work for the God Energy Force and the God Energy Spirit, um, and I'm just an instrument. But to me, it's like a, a pat on the back, I think. It was just a nice pat on the back.